But the way we see the problem is the problem. This means that the problem is not just out there, but it's also in our relationship to it, in our thinking about it, in our problem-solving approach. U.S. President Dwight Eisenhower said, when a problem can't be solved, enlarge it. We'll choose a big one. Land degradation or desertification is an ancient problem as well as a modern one, affecting both rich and poor countries. Like the climate issue, it doesn't yield easily to simple prescriptions. To treat land degradation as simply a consequence of climate change, as many high-profile organizations have been doing, simply keeps both of them from being solved. To enlarge the problem, we need to combine them. This can be scary because these are two of the most serious and overwhelming problems we face. Most of our science and formal knowledge isn't working, even with billions spent. To see how these two problems connect with each other means reviewing some key understandings which are still not part of general knowledge or formal learning, though the discoveries and innovations have been around for many years. We'll cover three key concepts. Number one, microbes rule. The biosphere is a powerful geologic and creative force. By the way, the biosphere is defined as the totality of life, living and dead, plus its interactions with rocks, waters, and air. And this biosphere functions in wholes, not parts. And we'll choose accept for now, although once you grasp the opportunities with this, you will no doubt choose rejoice. We're still teaching school children that species are how nature is organized. We have conservation and weed laws based on the larger, more visible species. But microbes, as well as plants, make up the bulk of the living material on Earth. Their function, what they do, makes it possible for larger creatures to exist. Some scientists go so far as to say that a large animal, such as a deer or a human, can be viewed as an ark for microbes, a kind of mobile metropolis for the microbes that live in it and on it. And life doesn't just sit there. It does work. And the greater the mass of life, the more work it can do. The biosphere is the totality of life on the planet, both past and present, living and dead. We recognize that it is diverse and complex, but we treat it mostly as an object, as a noun rather than a verb, as a thing rather than a process. But each year, new scientific discoveries show that the biosphere is a powerful creative force. Most of us realize that fossil fuels are the residue of ancient life, but living organisms are also responsible for the composition of the atmosphere and for much of ocean chemistry. A tenth of our surface rock, such as limestone and chalk, is formed from the shells of living creatures. Bacteria deposited the bands of iron where we get most of our steel. Living creatures, along with weathering, built the planet's soils, the bodies of these living things, live and dead, maintain and protect these soils from the weather. Each year, the biosphere does about nine times the work, meaning force over distance, as all our industrial energy combined. But we tend not to notice it as work, because this work is quiet, spread out, and slow. This work is also invisible to the naked eye because it is chemical work, breaking apart chemical bonds between atoms. The important thing here is not the detailed chemistry, but the fact that work is being done. With a kind of two-stroke pump, 
plants store solar energy in chemical bonds, which in turn supply energy and building materials for life, as well as free oxygen in the atmosphere. Plants store solar energy by splitting water and carbon dioxide and building complex carbon compounds such as sugars and cellulose. It takes work to do this. This work is powered by the sun. The reverse of this solar pump is called oxidation or respiration. It is also a two-stroke process, and it does work as it releases this stored solar energy. It fuels growth and motion, perceptions, actions, and choices in fungi and bacteria as well as in humans. When it is triggered by heat and occurs outside of a living cell, we call it fire. It is the reversibility of these reactions that enables the biosphere to cycle matter continuously, given a supply of solar energy. The pattern of this work is the carbon cycle, a circular, never-ending flow of matter that flows through and connects all life. It is the circle of birth, growth, death, and decay. Like the water cycle, it is driven by solar energy, and so it is seasonal. We see the carbon cycle, for example, in the seasonal cycle of leaves which change color as they grow, die, and decay. Complex carbon compounds such as sugars and cellulose are shown here as the letter C. Bacteria, fungi, large animals, fire, all of which feed on this captured solar energy will oxidize most of these complex carbon compounds back into carbon dioxide. All living material, including our bodies, has carbon as a principal element. We are completely dependent on complex carbon compounds that are built by the work of plants. As the circle of life goes around, some of these carbon compounds go onto the soil as litter or mulch, and into the soil as secretions from roots and as the dead roots themselves. Millions of kinds of tiny soil organisms turn some of these carbon compounds into soil organic matter, which is at least half carbon by dry weight and can last for hundreds of years. Organic matter enhances the soil's ability to absorb and retain water and supply plants with nutrients. Worldwide, Soils hold more carbon than the atmosphere and the vegetation or living material combined. Carbon or biomass on and in soils has enormous leverage on how the water cycle functions. Though we often blame rainfall or the lack of it, bare soils that cannot accept or hold water are the underlying cause of much flooding, short-term drought, and soil erosion. This is an energy landscape, so it is kind of upside down with the atmosphere at the bottom. A carbon atom in the atmosphere might be captured by a plant during photosynthesis and become part of a complex carbon compound such as sugar or cellulose. From there, it might be oxidized or used as food by something else and return to the atmosphere as carbon dioxide. Or it might remain for a time in higher energy potential, for example, as wood or soil organic matter. 
Some of the carbon atoms in your body have passed through dinosaurs. Now we have a system of carbon cycling. The rates of photosynthesis and oxidation give us the pattern of carbon in the biosphere. If oxidation is rapid, for example, with frequent fires or exposed soils, we get much more carbon in the atmosphere and less in plants and soils. When there is less carbon in plants and soils and more in the atmosphere, there is less soil cover and soil organic matter to hold water. The biosphere does less work and there is less food available. When there is more carbon in plants and soils, there is more water in the soil, more photosynthesis, more work, more food, and more of what we need and the rest of life needs. It can be a reinforcing or positive feedback loop. Our human hand is on the throttle. Our decisions at every level determine not only how fast we burn fossil fuel carbon, but have a huge influence on how the biosphere's carbon cycle and water cycle operate. There are tremendous opportunities with this, as well as tremendous responsibilities. In the next video, I'll show you some specific examples of how people are engaging with them and how you can too.